obviously I wasn't prepared for the video to be over. Um, Matt Tony made that video this week just for a one, yeah. Um, and then he threw in a Bruce Springsteen drop just for me. I, um, anybody who knows me knows I love Bruce Springsteen, and so that was, a, that was a pleasant surprise when I saw that. So I guess we're just gonna keep using that video no matter what service or series we're in. So um, anyway, my name is Rob. I was here last week, and you came back. So thank you. That was very, uh, very kind of you to do that. Um, I don't know about you. I spent the last week, uh, I'm, I'm sure everybody had a fun last week. Uh, my last week was spent mostly feeling anxiety over the possibility that my friend Jephthah from college might listen to my sermon online. Uh, I have not received any text messages or phone calls, so I think we're cool. But um, that, was, that was a thing I thought about late at night, every night as I was trying to fall asleep. Like, I wonder if Jephthah listened to that. Um, anyway, so I hope everybody's doing, doing well. I, uh, so last week, we're, so we're in this two-part series, like Matt said, uh, where we were talking about, it's, it's called Do No Harm. And last week, we talked about a, a story in which somebody takes their faith, takes all the zeal and passion that they have for their faith, and does an unbelievable amount of harm with that. So today, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about the harm that we do when we become kind of complacent or indifferent to what is happening in the lives of others. Last week, it was all about like what happens when your passion outruns your understanding of what God is like. This week, it's like, well, what, what happens when my passion kind of just dies on the vine and I don't really have much to, to think or, or to offer at all? So um, I, once, I once did this. We're going to be looking at a, at, a, at a passage from the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 3. We're going to get to that in a minute. I once did a series when I was a pastor I did a series on the book of Revelation, and when I announced that I was going to be doing this series where we, we were going to do a, it was a pretty long, like, in-depth look at the book of Revelation, and so I, I announced to the church that we were going to be doing this, and everyone sort of had, like, the cool sort of look to them. Like, in fact, there was a lady sitting in the front row, and she, she was wearing, like, a cardigan, and as I said the book of Revelation, she, like, took it and, like, as, if, as if the room got colder. She, like, closed it up and, like, no, I'm not prepared. This, it's just going to get weird and bad, and I'm not prepared for that. So we're, <laughs> we're going to look at the book of Revelation, or a passage from the book of Revelation today, and fully acknowledging, yeah, some of the stuff in there is very, very weird. But what, one of the things that is useful when, we look, when we're looking at Revelation, as weird as it can get, is that what we're doing more than anything else, we are looking at somebody else's mail from thousands of years ago. So the question that we have to ask anytime we look at this is, how would the people who first received this, what, what would they have thought? How would they have felt? How would this have struck them at, at the point in time in which they received this letter? So the book of Revelation is a letter written to seven different churches in what was known as Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey at the time. And inside, the, so the Revelation is 22 chapters long, and inside the book of Revelation, there are seven mini letters written, like, addressed to each of the seven individual churches that are receiving this letter. So it's a, it's a long letter, but there's also, inside of it, there are these short letters. And each one is addressed to a different city, in, like, a, a different church in a different city. And so what we're looking at today is we're looking at one of, one of those seven letters. And the letter we're looking at is to a city, to a church in a city called Laodicea. And one thing that's really important to understand as we get into this letter is the city of Laodicea as a whole was very, very, very wealthy. It was one of the wealthiest cities in, the, in the, that part of the world at the time. And so, and there were three components to their wealth. So the question becomes like, why was this city, why was it so much wealthier than all the other cities in, in its time? And the first is, so there are three reasons why, there are three major components to the, to the wealth of the people of Laodicea. The first is Laodicea was the banking center of this part of the world. So in this region, in, the, in ancient Turkey. So this is basically like Wall Street, right? If you needed money or to interact with any sort of major financial institution, you would have to go to Laodicea or interact with somebody who would go to Laodicea on your behalf. Not only did they have all their own financial stuff, I mean banking, this is what we call it, financial stuff. So not only did they have their own financial stuff, they were also housing the financial stuff for lots of other people. So within the city of Laodicea, there's lots and lots of gold. So they have, they have the banking center, but they also have a, a massive reserve of gold in the city. So that's the first thing, is there's lots of gold in the banking center. The second thing that makes Laodicea so wealthy is they were a major manufacturer and exporter of a certain kind of black wool. There was a kind of sheep that was indigenous to this area that naturally produced a very fine, thin kind of black wool that made very nice clothes. And if you were a wealthy person and you wanted to show off your status, you would probably have bought a garment or two that was made from this black wool. So the city becomes the chief exporter of this very expensive, well-made type of, of wool in these garments. So if you were a wealthy person, again, if you're a wealthy person living in or near this part of the world at the time, you would have thought, like, I would like, I need to have something made from this black wool. 
cool so that I can show like how wealthy and, um, and connected I am. So that's the second thing. So, so they've got the banking and the gold, they have the black wool. And then the third thing that makes Laodicea so wealthy, it was the home of a famous medical school. And one of the things that made the medical school so profitable is that they developed something called Phrygian powder. I'm probably mispronouncing this, but it's like Phrygian powder is what it looks like on paper. And um, that, that was, it was used, this, this powder was specifically used to make a very gentle, effective eye salve. So if you live, like, say, in a desert-like climate, like most of the people at this time did in, who were receiving this letter, you might have had dry eyes a lot. So Laodicea becomes the chief exporter of this particular product that lots of people all over this region are using quite a bit. So in one city, you have these three major sources of income. So Laodicea becomes incredibly wealthy as a result of these three things. So now... That's a lot of information, and for a little while, you're going to be like, why did, why did you tell me all that? We're going to get to it. But so now, understanding all of that, we're going to look at a passage from the book of Revelation to the, the, the people who are living in the city who are quite wealthy. So in Revelation 3, beginning in verse 14, it says this. It says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea. And by the way, in the book of Revelation, uh, or I guess all over, in, in the Greek language, the word angel, it's angelos. It, it literally means messenger. And so what, this is not necessarily referring to some sort of like immortal being. This is probably referring to whoever's job it was to read off, like the, whoever receives the letter to read it to the community. So whoever the messenger is, whoever the, the person responsible for conveying information to the people, that's what that's a reference to. So to the angel, to the messenger of the church in Laodicea, right? These are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. In other words, what I'm about to tell you, that's not me talking. And the writer, by the way, is a guy named John. The, it, the, and what John is saying here is like, this is not me talking. This is the voice of Jesus. This is the voice of God that I'm about to speak in. And then it says, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot or neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. So this is a passage, I don't know, I don't know how you grew up, I don't know if you heard this, but like last week we talked about a story, and most of the people who came up to me after the services were like, I had never heard that story before. So my guess is, this is not one of those passages. My guess is you probably have heard this passage at least once if you grew up in a church environment. And probably the way you heard this passage explained was, hot is good and cold is bad, right? Like it, the, if, if your faith is on a continuum, the idea of hot is like, I am on fire for Jesus. And then cold is like, I don't care one way or another, right? Like that's how it was explained probably to most of us who went to like church youth camp when we were kids. Here's the thing, and this may surprise you. This is not at all what this writer is saying. If you lived, so what, so what the writer is not saying is hot is good and cold is bad and lukewarm is just like whatever. Um, if you lived in a city as wealthy as Laodicea, you might become accustomed to a certain way of life, right? And as part of this way of life, you probably used to getting pretty much whatever you want whenever you need it. And a major source of aggravation for the people who live in Laodicea, the one thing that this city does not have is a good supply of water. So we're gonna take a look at a map. I created this map, and so it's not gonna look great. So, um, so here we have, th we have the city of Laodicea. It's, this, is, this is a map of Asia Minor as I, a as I imagine it. So we have, we have the city of Laodicea, and the city of Laodicea exists along a river called the Lycus River, and the Lycus River famously has a weak water flow. In fact, it even dries up during the hot summertime. So it, it, it basically, if you're looking for a good, consistent source of water, the Lycus River is not what you're looking for. And if you ever need to start a city, and this is important, if you ever decide you want to start your own city, you need to know this. You, gotta, you, you need to be as close to a good supply of water as you can get. So the question becomes, okay, so the people of Laodicea, they have this city, and it's by a pretty bad, if nothing at all, kind of water supply. So for the people of Laodicea, there are a couple of different options. There are two major options for a good water supply. Hierapolis to the north and Colossae to the southeast. And so Hierapolis, and I'm probably mispronouncing that word. <laughs> oh, my gosh. There are so many lines on the screen. Um, if you, um, I, was, I didn't look at this beforehand. I didn't see, I didn't know how this was going to look. This is very confusing. So the line going down, not the lines going crisscross, uh, if you can see through the chain link fence here, the, <laughs> the, so Hierapolis is about four miles to the north of Laodicea. And the city uh, of, of Hierapolis has a pair of hot springs. It, and that, actually, they're still active to this day. And the hot water comes bubbling out of the ground. It's currently channeled, actually, into the bathing pools of various local hotels in the area. And so the, the water comes out of the ground and spills over the cliffs of the city. And so in the first century, what the people of Laodicea do with their resources 
is they build aqueducts to bring the water to Laodicea into, into the center of the valley about four miles away. But here's the thing. If the water is piping hot when it comes up out of the ground, so they build these tubes, they these pipes, to go from Hierapolis into Laodicea. But after it's traveled four miles in the aqueducts, it's not hot anymore. It's lukewarm. So not just that, but because of the natural chemicals that make the water so hot when it comes out of the ground, it's unusable. It, 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 you can't drink it when, when it gets cooler. So by the time it cools off and becomes lukewarm, it's absolutely useless. There's nothing you can do. So they build this really expensive, long aqueduct, and it, does, and it ends up having no positive results at all. It just gives them lukewarm water that they can't do anything with. So that's Hierapolis to the north. Now, Colossae to the southeast, and this is not to scale. Colossae is like twice as far away as Hierapolis was, but I only had so much room. So what are you going to do? So Colossae is about 11 miles away. And if, you, uh, if, if you're familiar with probably a book in the Bible called Colossians, this is the city where that letter was written to. And so Colossae has an incredible source of cold water. It, it, it's actually a fantastic water supply because it comes down from the snow-capped Mount Cabanus. And so by the time the water, so what they do now is they, they say, well, okay, we'll pipe in the cold water from Colossae into Laodicea, and by the time it gets to us, we'll have cold water. But here's the thing. After the water has tri traveled 11 miles, it feels like a math problem, doesn't it? So once the water has tra traveled the 11 miles from Colossae to Laodicea, the water's not cold anymore because it's hot in ancient Turkey. And so by the time it gets there, by the time it's traveled the 11 miles through the aqueduct, guess what temperature it is? It's lukewarm. So it's this weird, like, geographical anomaly, right? Like, you have a super hot water to the north, you have super cold water to the southeast, and by the time it reaches you, it's all the same temperature. It's all lukewarm water. So it's, again, it's kind of like a geographical wonder. Like, how in the world did this really wealthy city end up with no usable supply of water? So why, in the letter in Revelation 3, why does Jesus accuse the people of the church of being lukewarm like the local water supply? So this is the question. So in Revelation 3, 16, it says, So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. What is that about? You say, I am rich. I, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. So here's the thing. About 30 years prior to this letter being written, in the city of Philadelphia, which is also one of the letters addressed in the book of Revelation, in the city of Philadelphia, there was a massive earthquake. And it devastated a huge portion of Asia Minor. And lots of the cities in Asia Minor had to be rebuilt or in large part. And one of the things that all these cities that John is writing to have in common is that they are all occupied by the Roman Empire, which is usually considered like a bad thing, right? Like nobody wants to be occupied by a foreign aggressive power. Here's the one positive of being occupied by Rome is if your city is destroyed by a natural, natural disaster, Rome is going to provide resources to help you rebuild your city because it's part of their empire. They want it to be, they want it to be functional. They want it to work. And so uh, Rome starts offering resources and money and manpower to send to help rebuild all these different cities that have been devastated by this earthquake. So Rome begins sending all this money to all these different cities, and the only city in all of Asia Minor that says, no thanks, we're good on our own, was Laodicea because they already have all the resources they need. There was a certain amount of pride, and this, this wasn't like, no, 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 we're fine. This was a, um, like a, a sense of like pride, like, no, we can take care of ourselves. We don't need anybody's help. And to accept help would have been to acknowledge some amount of weakness or some, some amount of like felt poverty. And la the Laodiceans were having none of it. So when Rome offered to help, they said, no, thanks, we've got it. So when they say, so when, when John writes to this group of people and says, you say we don't need any help, that's what he's referring to. So now let's finish it. So in, Rome, uh, in Revelation 3, 16, uh, let's go back to 16 and we'll, we'll read it back through. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Which is an interesting, like, why is he saying this to this group of people who are not poor at all? So in one of the earlier letters, one, if, you, if you go through all of these, and really we could spend all kinds of time just getting into the seven letters, seven mini letters in Revelation. But one, in one of the early letters, the one written to the people of Smyrna, uh, he tells the, the people that they feel poor because they were. The people in Smyrna were, were just abjectly poor. And so, there were, so he tells them, I know you, you feel like you're poor, but you're using all your resources to help other people. So even though you feel poor, you're actually quite rich. So he says this to the people in Smyrna, and then later on to the people in Laodicea, 
He says, you feel rich, but you're actually quite poor. Why were they rich? So why were the people in Smyrna rich? Because in spite of their poverty, they're using what they have to help people, and they're bringing life and goodness into the world. And now he says to this group of people, you're rich, but you're actually poor, blind, and naked. So apparently, it's possible to be poor and somehow still be rich. But it's also possible to be rich and somehow be poor. In Jesus' economy, things seem to work differently. In the world of the scriptures, poor and rich are not about what you have. They're about what you do with what you have. So, again, apparently for Jesus, the, the, the economy works differently than it does for the rest of us. So to be rich in Jesus' economy is to use what you have to bring some amount of joy and grace and peace and goodness into the world. And most of the other cities and, and churches that are addressed in Revelation have suffered intensely. They've suffered from earthquakes. They've suffered from religious persecution. They've suffered from poverty. And for some reason, somehow, Laodicea has kind of bypassed a lot of the suffering that the rest of these churches have experienced. And then you have this whole city including the people of this church, who are perfectly wealthy and comfortable in the midst of their brothers and sisters who are poor and suffering. There's a contrast. One of these things is not like the other. The people of Laodicea have not struggled in the way that everybody else has struggled. And when offered some amount of help, when they did struggle, they say, no, 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 we can take it from here. We can take care of ourselves. So then in Revelation 3.18, it says, I counsel, again, this is the word, these are the words of Jesus. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold, refined in the fire so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Do you remember what three things made this city so wealthy? Gold, wool, and eye salve, right? So now Jesus, through this writer John, is saying, here's what you need to do. You need to rethink all the things that have made you wealthy in the first place. Because it turns out the things that made you rich have actually made you poor. He talks about buying these things from God. He talks, he's speaking in terms that they're going to understand, right? He's speaking in economic terms. He's saying, let's, let's rethink all these things that have made you rich. Because it turns out we need to take another, a whole new look at all of it. He's saying the things that have made you rich have actually made you poor. In other words, your wealth has actually caused you to feel separated from the rest of the world. You are, you are disconnected from the suffering and the struggles of the people around you. So imagine you live in one of these other cities that John is writing to, and you've been devastated by, by earthquake or overtaxation, and you don't have the resources that the people in Laodicea have. You are barely making it. You are, you are just almost not even hanging on at all. And you learn that one of the other cities and, and one of the other churches quite near you, is they're not just making it, they're thriving. And it, it, not only are they thriving, they're doing it without anybody's help from anybody. And in the aftermath of the earthquake, not only did Laodicea receive or refuse to receive help in rebuilding, they also, quite noteworthy, did not offer to help anybody. They were like, we're just going to take care of ourselves. So what's the writer saying when he says, you think you're rich, but you're actually poor? He's saying your status and your resources and your ability to be self-sufficient have actually led you to being unconcerned with what everybody else in your region is going through. So why does the writer use this language of lukewarm water? Well, this is a sore spot, obviously, for the people of Laodicea, so he's trying to get their attention. Like, you know that, that like, town-wide embarrassment of your lo local water supply? That's you, is what he's saying. So, but here's the thing also, both hot water and cold water, this is why it's not like cold is bad and hot is good. Cold water and hot water in, in, a, in a, again, if you're starting a city, this is useful information. Cold water and hot water each have a useful, they, they all have value. Hot water is good for sterilization, it's good for bathing, it's good for medical purposes. Cold water obviously is good for drinking. And so you can use hot water and you can use cold water. Lukewarm water is useless. You can't do anything with lukewarm water. And so the writer is saying, you have disengaged from the story that God is telling. You're not even in the game at all. You know that water that no one needs? That's you. So why send this letter to seven different churches? This is another question. If, if you're looking through the whole book of Revelation and it stops down and it starts addressing each of these seven different churches, why not just send seven different letters? Why send one letter to all seven churches if, they, if the message to each church is so different? And each, each church is going through its own specific, unique kind of thing. I would argue it's because John wants this group of people to feel like they're all in this together. 
I would argue the reason you send one letter to seven churches is because you want each of these seven churches to feel like, oh, we're a part of this too. This is, this is a larger movement than just our one local church. And so, some, so when, when one group of people says, hey, we're good, we don't need to receive any help, we don't feel the need to offer help to anybody else, they are excusing themselves from their responsibility to care about the well-being of anybody who isn't them. And John is saying, no, I'm sending this letter to everybody so you know you're all connected in some kind of way or another. Everybody, like the fate of one connects to the fate of everybody else. So lukewarm water, when John refers to them as lukewarm water, this is about selfishness. This is about disengagement. Lukewarm is about a total disinterest in the well-being of other people as long as, hey, I'm okay. So John uses the one image that everyone in the city is going to understand as it relates to something that is completely, completely without purpose, lukewarm water. He's saying, again, he's saying, you know that water that no one needs? I hate to say it, but it's kind of you at this point. So, and by the way, this is not a way of saying that wealth is bad or that you sh or, and the comfort is bad. He's not saying get rid of everything. He's not saying move to a less uh, wealthy city. What he's saying is take what you have and do something with it. Do something useful with it. What the writer is saying is it is possible to be wealthy and to still completely miss the bigger story. It is possible to have everything you need and to still somehow be disengaged from what's going on in the rest of the world. Um, I, when I was a pastor, I was, I was a pastor in a town um, called Roanoke. It's near Fort Worth, Texas. And um, we, about two years after we started our church, we moved into downtown Roanoke. And, um, and one of the questions we started asking as a church was, are, are there people in our community who need a church, but not just like a place to go on Sunday morning, but who actually need some sort of support or encouragement or some sort of help? And so we started, uh, the leadership of, of the church started joining like the like neighborhood face, Facebook groups of, of just the, the area around. And one of the things that came up really quickly, because Roanoke at the time, it was, it's near the Texas Motor Speedway. There's, it, it's kind of a, it was kind of a booming downtown at the time. And so one of the things that happened was lots of developers started coming in and buying up property around Roanoke. And um, one of the things we learned really quickly was there was a trailer park about a half mile away from where our church was going to be, and a developer had bought the trailer park and was basically giving all the tenants a certain amount of time, a really, like, a, basically as legally short an amount of time as he could possibly do, and to basically get out so that he could rip everything down and build a shopping strip. And it worked. There's a Starbucks there now. And so... Um, and so one of the things that happened on the, the discussion boards was people kind of crying out. Like, I have a family member who lives in this, in this trailer park community. I have, um, I have friends. We have people who go to church with us. And they have no place to go. Some of these trailers are in really bad shape. They can't just up and move. They have no pl Like, again, there's, there's just a limited amount of space here for people who, um, who need a place to live. And, and so it became sort of like this public outcry, which obviously didn't work. But it became a public outcry of what are we going to do? And there was one guy who commented on the thread. I can't believe, like, it's one of those things. You, you ever hear somebody say something out loud and you think, oh, did, you, did you mean to say that out loud? Like, this guy goes on the thread and says, like, I don't know about any of this. I'm just glad my, pop, my property value is going to go up finally. Like, again, that's the thing. Like, I understand somebody may be thinking that to themselves. I cannot fathom, like, the, the willpower to say that to a group of people and think, like, this is probably going to go great. You know what I mean? And so this, the attitude of this person was, like, how like the fate of all these people, these dozens and dozens of people who are living in this community who are about to have no place to go, that has nothing to do with me. What I care about is my house value is going to go up, so I've got that going for me. What is that? that? I think John would say that's a lot like lukewarm water, right? It is I, like the fate of everyone else in the world makes no difference to me as long as I'm okay. And to be connected to the story that God is telling is to be deeply concerned about the well-being of other people. Lukewarm water, the things that have given me the ability to help people or to help people have actually separated me from any concern for those people. The things that have made me rich have actually made me poor. Uh, we, and we, could, we could go a thousand different directions with this. If we had more time, we could, we could spend all day just talking about the different ways that this kind of branches off and, and reflects us back to us in our own lives. We could talk about any, like any number of ways. We could talk about privilege. Um, like we could talk about gen gender equality, right? So lots of men in this world do not believe that gender inequality exists, that women are paid less in general than men are in most jobs, that 
By the way, attending a church with a female senior pastor is very unusual in this part of the world. Um, there, there are certain denominations that would absolutely forbid that kind of thing. And so it's the, the idea that women are, in general, given less privilege and status than men is still true. And so, but there, again, there are lots of mostly men in the world who would argue, no, it's not true. There is no gender inequality. Why? Because it's never happened to them. Because they have a certain amount of protection from that kind of discrimination and that kind of treatment. And so they don't have to worry about it because it's never been their problem before. And so the very thing that gave them a certain amount of privilege in the world is the same thing that makes them unaware that it doesn't work like that for everybody else. You know what I mean? So the thing that makes this person, like if, if I say there is no such thing as gender inequality, the thing that has made me have some amount of privilege has actually made me poor. To be rich in Jesus's economy is to be fully aware of and engaged with the struggles and the disadvantages of other people. We can have the same conversation about race. I know Meredith uh, not long ago did a, did a whole sermon about this, about the struggle of racism in the world that we live in today. If someone were to say, in our world, we still have a lot of healing and reconciliation to be done around the subject of racial inequality, then someone else, very probably a white person, would say, no, 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 didn't you hear? We fixed that. <laughs> we solved it already. Why does that person say that? Because it's never happened to them. I'm a 40-something-year-old man, <laughs> and I'm white, and I live in Oklahoma. I've, you, this, you're going to shock. You're going to be shocked at this. I've never been the, the victim of racial inequality. It's never been a problem for me. So for me to say, well, if it's never been a problem for me, then it probably doesn't exist. What is that? That is, oh, my privilege has separated me from my ability to connect to other people who have experienced those, those kinds of things. It is possible for the thing that gives me advantages and privileges to also be the thing that makes me poor, that makes me less connected to what's going on in the lives of the people around me. It is possible for our economic and social advantages to make us unaware of the struggles of other people. It is also possible for us to take what we have and to leverage it to make the lives of people better to acknowledge the struggles and the sufferings that other people have experienced. So the question becomes, what do I have right now that I can use to make somebody else's life better? What do I have that makes me rich that I can take and then leverage it to make somebody else's life a little bit easier or a little bit better or a little bit more equal? So John has some pretty harsh things to say. He calls this group of people lukewarm water. But then look what he says next in Revelation 3.19. He says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. He says, so after this whole thing, about after, after he calls them a whole bunch of names, he says, this whole thing isn't coming from a place of anger or judgment. It's coming from a place of love. He's saying, I want you to be exactly who God created you to be. In fact, he uses the word repent. And in the Hebrew mind, the concept of repent is the idea of returning to something. So when John says, or when Jesus says, I want you to repent, what Jesus is saying here is, I want you to return to the identity of the person that you were always meant to be. I want you to become more and more of who I created you to be, to be the best version of yourself. And that means to be deeply connected to the struggles and the suffering of the people around you. Then in, in verse 20, he says this. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. So the whole structure of this letter looks like this. You, the people of Laodicea, have been so self-absorbed and closed off to the needs of others that you have become useless to the work of God in the world. I am so frustrated by this. You need to rethink what you view of as valuable in life. Now, with that said, please know that I love you, so let's share a meal together. That's the structure of the letter. The whole thing ends on a meal. And I love what Miss D said earlier about communion, about everyone's invited to the table. What is, what is a meal? A meal is an invitation to connect with other people in a real, in a significant way. It's not just taking something to go. It is, I'm going to spend time here, and we're going, we, we're going to acknowledge that there is a sacred thing happening here, that all of life is a gift, we, and we have all received this gift, and we're all responsible for what we do with this gift. A meal is an invitation into community. So the whole thing starts with, 
you think you're rich, but you're poor, and you kind of miss the whole point. But hey, it's not too late to make better choices. It's not too late to connect with what's going on in the lives of others. So let's share a meal together, and let's figure out the next step in this journey. So no matter who you are or what you've done or how you view yourself, the good news of this letter is that God says to you, I love you, and I want to invite you to join me at my table. So may you be fully aware of all the ways that you have the power to offer grace and comfort and generosity to other people. May we be fully engaged in what's going on around us, in the lives of others. May we not dismiss somebody else's struggles or suffering as just not my problem. Because I think the point of this letter is, is a way of saying, no, it is your problem. We're all in this together. We are all connected in our shared humanity. So let's not be like lukewarm water. May we be awake and aware of what's going on in the lives of the people around us. And more than anything, may you remember, above all else, you are loved. And you have the power to bring more grace and peace into the world. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you for this reminder to be awake and aware. May we tune in to the cry of others. May we be, not be dismissive simply because we don't feel like something else is my problem. May we not be like lukewarm water. May we use our resources and our time and our attention and our concern in such a way that we become rich in all the ways that you invite us to. May we walk through the world asking the question, what can I do to bring more grace and more peace and more love and more generosity into this place? In the name of Jesus, we pray.